Okay, so we are about to start our third and last part, and this part will be driven by, our, by some of our visiting researchers. The first of them is Kate Crawford, who is visiting from the University of New South Wales from Australia. Please welcome her. So hi, everyone, and uh, welcome back. Today, I'm going to take a high-speed challenge, and I'm going to try and give you six provocations about big data in just eight minutes. So it's a race against the clock, and it's a race against Christian. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to have to try and beat him. I should say from the outset that this is based on a paper which was published last week in a collaboration with Dana Boyd, who unfortunately can't be here. And if you'd like to see the full thing, not at high speed, uh, you can find it on SSRN. So what do I mean by big data? Obviously, big data can mean lots of different things, but in essence, it's about massive amounts of interlinked information. So that can be used in some ways in the biological sciences, in economics, in market research. But for me, and today, I'm just going to be talking about social media, the kind of data that we see in spaces like Facebook and Twitter. And in sum, what we say in this paper is that we think that with big data comes big responsibilities. So first, provocation. Automating research actually changes the idea of knowledge. So I'm going to take you back to the early years of the 20th century, when Henry Ford was revolutionizing the way that cars were being made. He introduced new tools like assembly lines, mechanized forms of production. He broke down units of human labor into their most atomized components to try and increase efficiency. But it was more than just new tools. Effectively, Henry Ford completely changed the way we thought about work for the first half of the 20th century. Similarly, we think that big data is actually having really powerful transformations in terms of how we think about knowledge and research. It's not just about new tools, new resources, and new methods. Unfortunately, along with big data, we're also seeing the emergence of a philosophy that says that big data is all you need. You can essentially sweep away all of the other disciplines and ways of knowing. Here's a quote from Chris Anderson, who is the editor-in-chief at Wired magazine. This is a world where massive amounts of data replace every other tool, out with every theory of human behavior, from linguistics to sociology. Who knows why people do what they do? The point is they do it, and we can track it with unprecedented fidelity. With enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. Well, do they? We would suggest that actually the numbers don't speak for themselves, and that quotes like this are a kind of tell. They reveal that there can be sometimes an unfortunate undercurrent of arrogance in some big data research that assumes that once you've got the numbers, you actually don't need to think about where they came from or all of the kinds of contextualizing information that we've got from hundreds of years of scientific method. So the second provocation is that claims to objectivity and accuracy can sometimes be misleading. So there's this unfortunate perception that qualitative researchers are in the business of listening to stories and that quantitative researchers are in the business of producing facts. Well, we suggest that actually all researchers are in the business of interpreting data. And actually, our disciplines all inform the kind of interpretations that we make. So Lisa Gilliman writes about the fact that every discipline has its own way of imagining data. And each discipline has its own norms about how we recognize what data is. So part of what needs to happen in terms of big data is recognizing that our disciplines inform what we see and how we interpret that data. The second issue is around accuracy. And this is particularly true for those of us who use internet data. The internet is incredibly fragile. It's prone to outages, to breakdowns, messages go missing, things get deleted, which unfortunately many of us are familiar with. So in this sense, it's actually really important that we acknowledge that big data sets are never complete in this space, that they're going to have gaps. And those gaps are sometimes significant. The third provocation. Bigger, unfortunately, is not always better. So I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room who's often getting papers to review where a researcher will say, hey, we've got millions of tweets, so we can tell you exactly how people are using Twitter, and in some cases, say, exactly how people are using the internet. Well, there's a couple of problems with this. The first, of course, is what do those millions of tweets actually represent? There is sometimes this elision between a user and account and a Twitter message. And this gets quite complicated because some people have 
multiple Twitter accounts. Some people actually never post anything on Twitter. They just listen in. So how do we account for their participation? How do they show up in these millions of tweets? They're not part of that sample. And it's very difficult to then make assumptions and claims about how all Twitter users behave. So in this sense, we think it's really important that people match their tools to the kind of questions that they're asking. And that sometimes small data can actually be just as useful or in some cases more useful than big data. The fourth provocation, not all data are equivalent or the old problem of comparing apples and oranges. So now that we find that lots of spaces are more quantifiable than before, it means that lots of different areas of social data can be mapped. But just because they can be mapped doesn't mean that they can necessarily be compared. I'll give you an example. I'm thinking about social network analysis, which has been around since the 1950s. So when people use social network analysis now to consider what it is to have a social tie, what it is to actually be connected to people, we see studies that involve things like your Twitter friends or your Facebook friends to make claims about your tie strength. But this can have its own problems. Let me give you an example. My mother not on Facebook. If a researcher was looking at all of my tie strengths, they could look at my Facebook network and say, you know what, your mother, not really a close friend, not really significant in your life. And my mother would have a few issues with this finding. Unfortunately, this kind of thing isn't that uncommon. People are actually making big claims based on tie strength without realizing that the different kinds of social spaces we inhabit have granularities of difference, that they're not exactly the same. Just because they can actually be quantified doesn't mean that they're comparable. Fifth provocation. Something might be accessible, but does it mean it's ethical? Of course, there's a big scandal recently around a group of Harvard researchers who were conducting research about anonymous students on Facebook to see how their, f their friendships were changing over time. Of course, all it took was an external researcher to de-anonymize that study, to reveal who the students were, of course they were Harvard students, and to find out that they hadn't given permission for their data to be used that way. Of course, instant headlines. But I think things like this should make those of us who use big data feel pretty uncomfortable because it's not a straightforward and easy question. I'm not suggesting that we can get consent forms from every Twitter user or Facebook user. But I do think we need to have a fairly nuanced approach to what it means to think about ethics in these sorts of spaces. So perhaps that might mean that we need to have a different kind of analysis between what it is to be in public versus to be public and that in some cases people are not giving their consent for their data to be used in all of the ways that we might use it. The final provocation, we're gonna make it just in time. The concern around new digital divides. There is a threat that in future we could be looking at the creation of two classes, the big data rich and the big data poor. In some ways we can think about social media companies who at the moment have all the data. They don't have any obligation to give it to us. They don't have to, but in some cases they can sell it for lots of money, and only some people can afford that data. Think about that in a university context. The top tier, best funded universities can afford that data, and those that can't are not in the same position to skill their students in terms of wrangling with APIs and algorithms. And then we start to see that only students from the top tier universities will get the plum postdocs and the great industry jobs. So actually, this could create a widening divide over time. And then finally, there's an issue around skills. How do people in my area, social sciences, train our students to deal with the challenges of big data and to work with computational scientists? And we also have to train computational scientists to respect and understand why the social sciences are actually really useful in this field. So to sum up really quickly, there's obviously some fantastic research being done with big data and we commend it. But we would just say that it does raise serious questions about future research agendas. Lucy Suchman has this great line where she says, we are our tools. And I think it's a good moment to start asking how those tools are shaping the world as we're using them. Thanks. Thanks. Did I just Thank make it? Thank you, Kate, for almost <laughs> making it. I almost. think in the panel there will take away the time from you. Oh, I had a minute time. over. <laughs> okay, I'm sure you guys have tons of questions and we want to give it to you, so. Any questions? Yeah, we've got a question just up here. Hi. <laughs> you have to repeat it. All right, I've got six solutions. I just no, need eight minutes. No, what's the question? <laughs> <laughs> the question was what, what, 
The question is, what is the solution? And of course, this is actually really difficult. And I think in each one of the areas that I've outlined, we can talk about different kinds of solutions. Some of them are methodological solutions, and I think some of them, particularly around the ethics question, are going to be evolving. So let's take ethics. I mean, essentially, at the moment, if you're using big data sets, you might be thinking about the ethical questions right now, about what it means for the people that you're studying right now. What does it mean in 30 years' time or in 300 years' time? These are actually really difficult questions which we don't have a solution per se, but which we kind of need to start a very detailed, ongoing conversation about our methods and actually being really upfront about some of these questions. So I don't think there's like a quick fix, but I think it's going to be an, a long and ongoing conversation that we need to be having about some of these inbuilt questions and problems in big data use. So more questions? Well, I have one. <laughs> Christian's getting me back for being a minute over time. <laughs> right, now I will take some of your time. So the question is, um, in many of questions, privacy and people are looking at sort of the question, what does it mean in context? So mm. would you have a comment on that sort of big data in context? Well, this is the problem also with some studies that don't pay attention to context. Uh, this is really true with social media data. So a lot of users who might be, say, on Facebook, think about the immediate context of who they want to be messaging. They might be sending messages to their friends, their colleagues, their family. But in actual fact, all of those messages are being collected and farmed by a whole lot of different agencies and a whole lot of researchers. And in that sense, they're being used in completely different contexts. So in fact, in Dana's work, she's referred to this idea of context collapse. So how do we become more attuned and sensitive to this question of context with big data is actually quite difficult, because in some cases, the context is being erased. And that's part of what you need to do to actually anonymize the data. And Alessandro, who will be speaking this after me, will also be showing you how, in actual fact, it's really easy now to de-anonymize data. And that's going to become an increasing issue over the next few years. So I think context is both important but we have to be really attuned to some of the risks about what that context reveals. Okay, let's thank uh, Thanks, again. Guys. Okay, and let's welcome the last speaker before the